Also, liebe Freunde von Yad Vashem, sehr geehrte Botschafterin der Deutschen Republik in Israel, Frau Wassum Reiner, Damen und Herren, dear friends, and Shalom Haverim. Es ist mir eine Freude, Sie heute zur fünften Ausgabe unserer Talkserie begrüßen zu dürfen. Ich heiße Ruth Orr und ich bin zuständig für das Arbeit von Yad Vashem in die deutschsprachigen Länder. Da dieses Event auf Englisch ist, werde ich weiter auf Englisch sprechen. It is great to see some familiar faces again with us and some new faces. We're absolutely delighted to have you with us. The idea with this series, as those who have attended before, is to give you a special insight into the work of Yad Vashem, a behind the scenes insight, things that you couldn't read on a website or on a brochure, to hear from our experts about some of the challenges and the exciting aspects of the work that they do, whether it's in the archive or in international diplomacy, or indeed as in today in Holocaust education around the world. Our work in education is well, world renowned and I am also thrilled that uh, here in Germany we are getting a real push to our work in education with the recent appointment of Anna Leffer who's joining us on the call today. And it is a huge pleasure for me to introduce our moderator for today, who uh, Sylvia Lerman, for whom Holocaust education is a very, very heartfelt subject. Sylvia Lerman was for, is a former Dep Deputy Minister President of Nordrhein-Westfalen and Minister of Schools and Education in Nordrhein-Westfalen. She has been tireless in her efforts to ensure that Holocaust education is a prominent part of the school curriculum here in Germany. It was under her presidency that the Standing Conference of Education Ministers, known to us as the KMK, uh, formulated the guidelines for remembers, remembrance for the future. In 2020, Sylvia Lerman was appointed Secretary General of 321 to 2021 1,007 years of Jewish life in Germany. Sylvia is also, to add to all that, an energetic and supportive member of the German Freundeskreis of Yad Vashem. And I am very grateful to you, Sylvia, for taking the time today to moderate this. Before I hand over to Sylvia, I'd like to say that this session is being recorded, so please be aware of that. And finally, I would like to thank you, Eyal, for agreeing to talk to us this afternoon about the challenges of teaching the Holocaust today, a global view. I wish you all a stimulating hour and over to you, Sylvia. Sylvia, I don't think we can hear you. You're on mute. No, it's better now. Somebody took me off. Hello. Nice to hear you all. Thank you, Ruth, for this very kind introduction and your words. Um, and I'm really very, very pleased to see you all and to meet you all this way. And I also want to thank Ruth to you and your team that you created this sequence, this possibility to look behind the scenes. I think it in these times when we cannot meet, we cannot travel, um, that we really have the opportunity to, to follow the work, this important work, which doesn't stop. And I think this shows uh, the creativity of Yad Vashem, <laughs> but also of the different places, museums who work, who still go on working, although they are not open. And I think this is very, very important to, to underline that that our museums and cultural places are so, so, so important for our society. Uh, I don't know if you noticed and heard, I, I cannot say this, um, that during the demonstrations of people against Corona in the last days, young German 
pupils, young German girls compared themselves to Anne Frank or Sophie Scholl, um, um, feeling themselves that they cannot celebrate their birthday. And I think this shows, this makes something running down my back, this shows how important educational work is and that we haven't reached something, we have reached something, but we have to go on and on and on because stopping or going backwards means that we lose time and lose young people. Well, so thanks to you, Ruth and your team to, to, to create this sequence. And um, I'm delighted to moderate this session. I have visited Yad Vashem several times and it moved me again and again and is motivation to my commitment in remembrance work. The International School for Holocaust Studies is a real powerhouse of learning and education. I'm therefore happy that all the German lender have contracts to collaborate in teachers training and further education. And in North and Westphalia, there is even a strong partnership with an organization called Education Partners North and Westphalia and thus Yad Vashem, and this is a single thing, is the only outside North and Westphalia spot where there is a working together as a kind of outside learning spot outside of schools. Um, normally these are museums, remembrance sites and things like that, but Yad Vashem is the only place outside Northern Westphalia that is a partner. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Ayal Kaminka. Ayal has been director of International School for Holocaust Studies and Lily Safra Chair of Holocaust Education for more than seven years. Prior to assuming this position, he was lecturer at universities and colleges in Israel. Ayal is also author of several books published in Hebrew, including Keeper of Memories, or what's your purpose? Breakthrough thinking in daily life. Today, I'm excited to hear Ayal's thoughts on Holocaust education for a global audience, as well as the opportunity, of course, for a lively discussion after his presentation. So now, Ayal, over to you. Thank you very much, Sylvia, uh, for the introduction, and uh, to you, Ruth, and everybody here that. Uh, is present um, and start sharing uh, the screen. Just let me know because I can't see you be while, while, I, uh, while I share the screen, I can't see anyone just to let me uh, know that you can see that. Can, can you see? Everything is fine, yes. Okay, wonderful. So, uh, so again, thank you. And I have a very limited time for and, and many thoughts to share and many ideas. Um, and probably I will not uh, have sufficient time to share all the things that I want to. Um, I collected um, a few items um, from several lectures and packed them together in order to get a feeling of, uh, the title is behind the scenes, so uh, a feeling of the global perspective, global view of what we're facing um, in the International School for Holocaust Studies at Yad Vashem, how do we see the challenges and the barriers uh, in the field of uh, Holocaust education? So apologies in advance. I probably will not, uh, I will not have sufficient time to dive deep into any of the topics. Uh, I will stay a little bit on the global view. Um, and, and the titles of the challenges, I will raise questions. Um, but then if we have some time afterwards and uh, if you want to um, ask any question about the things that I said, then I will gladly be um, dive in deeper into um, any of the topics. So I'm going to um, move straight away to three questions that I want you to bear in mind. These are three questions that I ask my staff at Yad Vashem, uh, the international school, I asked myself on an organizational level, and of course, in terms of content level, what is our story, where is our story, and how is this story being delivered? 
these are three fundamental questions in education as well. You know, what is the education? What is the story of the education? Where is the education and how it's being delivered? I want to talk to you a little bit about a normal year. So a normal year is before the pandemic, before COVID-19. In a normal year, the challenges were huge. So I'm going to add the layer of the COVID in a minute. But before COVID, um, Holocaust education is part of the general education. The general education is confused, is, is in a junction. No one knows exactly where to turn. Uh, many of the professionals, almost all of the professionals say that it's not up to date. Uh, education systems are not effective, are not sufficient, maybe are not relevant to today's needs. But no one knows exactly what to do uh, for the future. We just know that 300 of uh, education systems that look, the technology changed, but they look, the process looks pretty much the same, is not up to date. Uh, so we're all confused. And within this context, we have the TLH, teaching and learning about the, about the Holocaust. Uh, and that's another layer of challenges. So when I look at Holocaust education, I can see four categories. I can look at four categories of challenges, and I'm going to review them very quickly. The first is time-related challenges. So what is time-related, time and distance? The Holocaust is perceived by many, many people as irrelevant, not relevant. It happened 70, 75, 80 years ago. It happened in the last century. It happened in the last millennia. First generation is passing the torch, sadly passing away. There are hardly anyone left to say, I was there, I saw it with my own eyes. Uh, many of the all the pictures, most of the pictures are black and white. It feels, the look and feel of the Holocaust is something that is just not relevant. Maybe, maybe it's a Jewish story. Maybe it belongs to you know, my great-grandfather's story, but why should I learn about something that happened so long ago? And as my kids uh, keep reminding me, it's even older than the 90s. Okay, so you know, why, why should I deal with that? And this uh, conception of the word relevancy, we're trying, it's, it's a huge challenge for us. And we're trying to deal with it by uh, reshaping the, the interpretation of what is relevant. So I'm not going to dive again deep into what we offer as what is relevant, but let, let, let's, let's stop here by saying that we need to convince the systems, the people, the teachers, the students, that the subject matter is relevant even for um, today. So that's one set of challenges. The other set of challenges is global trends. So we all aware of the rising anti-Semitism, the rising uh, um, uh, xenophobia and ignorance that is out there, uh, racism, uh, the rising of borders. We see it in Europe, we see it uh, all over the world. Uh, and when the borders are going up, then there is more hate for the other. Uh, and it's very easy to go to anti-Semitism and, and that has a very big effect on our ability to teach about, uh, about the Holocaust in the, in the classroom. But I actually want to talk about a different global trend, which is not necessarily connected or uh, perceived as connected to education. And that is um, the fake news that we hear over the, over the media. So we know that it affects fake news, affects the politics, and you know it affects our, you know what we know about the world. But we need to understand that it has a huge effect on the misconceptions and preconceptions of students when they come to to learn about the Holocaust. They already come with knowledge that they gain somewhere else. Because the status of the teacher is changing, the source of information is somewhere else. Remember the questions, what is our story, but where is the story? Where is the story? Not necessarily in the classroom. 
So they take the information from somewhere else and they come with a different set of information, uh, which is very troubling. I wanna give a concrete example. You know, when you type in Google a search query, you start typing and then Google starts to give you suggestions on how to finish your query, how to finish your search uh, entry. Um, and that's, you, you, the, the suggestions are according to a code that was written by the Google's experts or by popularity. So let me share with you, when I started to type the word, the sentence, Hitler was, okay? And I did that a while ago. And these are the uh, suggestions that Google um, offered me in order to finish the sentence, okay? So you see right now a screenshot of my computer when I start to uh, type Hitler was. If you can't see it well enough, let me just uh, get closer. So Hitler was, and here are suggestions. Hitler was a sensitive man. Hitler was an artist. Hitler was a British agent. Hitler was Australian or was asleep on uh, D-Day. These are all things that Google offers me as sources of information, as links that I can go to. Now, as a student, as a young student, I don't have the tools to differentiate between false data, fake data, and true data. And that's a very, very disturbing phenomenon that um, uh, we see, and I have plenty more examples. If I have time, I'll share it uh, uh, afterwards. Another set of challenges, uh, the third set, is actually perceiving the Holocaust as a symbol. So in, in, the Holocaust managed to, to uh, be acceptable as a symbol of evilness in, I guess, in, in all of the Western society, also a little bit in the, in the East uh, uh, of, the, of the globe. Um, and it perceived, in many cases, in many, in many, many minds, it perceived as, as something that, was, that is very bad, as kind of a North Star that symbolized pure evil. In fact, even, even sayings like never again that was associated with the Holocaust, and even though the world was again and again and again with many atrocities after the Holocaust, but still the, the word, the phrase, never again in the Holocaust managed to penetrate. And this is probably a good thing. However, in education, if a symbol stays a symbol with no content underneath, then we have a problem. The Holocaust has a time and a place. You have to learn about it and you have to dive deeper in order to draw meaning. Because if you don't do that, you go to a place where there is much ignorance, and we see that as well. So one phenomenon is that people are aware of the existence of the Holocaust, of, this, of the slogan, of the term Holocaust. In, in France, for example, they use the word, the Hebrew uh, uh, word, Shoah, right? But they don't know enough about it in order to draw meaning. So we see a rise of anti-Semitism. We see a lot of ignorance on the other hand, awareness, but ignorance. Um, so what we are trying to offer is a process that turns the symbol from, from symbol to meaning. And to do that, you need to dive deeper and you need to gain information. You need to turn the information um, into knowledge and you need time, you need to invest time. And this actually brings me to the fourth set, uh, fourth category of challenges that we face. Um, at the International School, we work with many, many countries, more than 70. Um, and that is the gap between technology and school and the schooling systems. And we see that gap all around the world. Um, so we all know about technology. We all use technology. We know what's um, what's around us. We also know that the education systems are slow in adapting new technologies. And there is a constant gap between the two. So I'm, I don't wanna talk uh, further about the meeting point between the, the, the technology and 
and uh, and the subject matter of the Holocaust on a technical side, I want to talk it. I want to share with you a thought about the philosophical meeting point between uh, a, a very hard topic like the Holocaust and technology issue. So, what is technology? The the aim of technology, the purpose of technology, is to basically to give us to to give me as a person more with less. So more comfort, more resources, more information, um, more comfort, more and more happiness in less time, less effort. Technology aims to make my life more comfortable. Now think about it in a, on a principle level, on a philosophical level, how hard is the meeting point between something that aims to bring me comfort to my life and a topic like the Holocaust, that the purpose of learning, or one of the purposes of learning, is to actually cause pain in the tummy, in you know, it's in, in the soul, to, to cause some anxiety. I call it ethical anxiety, to think of the atrocity and to draw meaning about, I don't know, the human race, about who I am, about whatever. But it's it's hard to learn about the Holocaust. So on one hand, I have the topic. On, one, on the other hand, I have the method, I have the tool, I have the platforms that are quick, that are fast, that um, aim to make my life more comfortable. And this meeting point is very hard for educators. What do you do with that? How do you compromise? And what are you willing to compromise in order to use the, the technology in order to deliver your message? Going back to the three questions, what is our story? Where is our story? And how do we deliver? So this is this goes to the third, um, to the third question. So all of these challenges are still challenging. They are still out there, but these are the regular challenges that we faced uh, before 2020. But then 2020 arrived with COVID-19. I remember the day. It was March 15, where uh, for us at Yad Vashem, we closed, we shut down the doors. Um, it was very uh, dramatic. What do you do? What happens here? So a little bit of a, of a, of a worldview in terms of, of education. In many aspects, the COVID um, put a dynamite in, in cracks that were already there but suddenly blew up in, in our faces uh, in terms of the politics, in terms of workforce, certain processes that were um, that are related to, to the juggling and to the balance between working from home, working in, in, in spaces, you know, what and, and many, many other questions um, contributes to social change and also to education. Some of the things that we already feel in terms of education. We feel changes in terms of the physical changes, in terms of budgets, in terms of the learning processes, um, even the atmosphere of you know what what is our, my state of mind where I come to uh, to study, and of course uh, goals and and uh, and purposes. And um, you probably uh, the educators that are here, and I saw some familiar faces in the crowd, uh, probably are aware of this uh, slide. It was taken from uh, the website of UNESCO a while ago. That's from May. There are much, uh, uh, much more up-to-date uh, uh, pictures of the world and how many students were affected, how many systems were affected by the closure, by the COVID-19. Here it says uh, one point almost two billion students. It was even much hard, higher uh, later on. But it is a world you know, thing, world uh, challenge that is is really mind uh, mind blowing. Um, I said uh, a word about budgets, and I don't want to elaborate about that. But we do feel in education um, budget cuts. Uh, we see increased costs, but um, um, uh, mostly for the physical aspects. So governments invest money in education, but they invest it in computers, for example, for the more needed families, needed uh, st uh, students, um, but not necessarily for programs. And we already see 
um, the effect uh, of that. Um, philanthropy as well, or the fight of health and security versus anything else. Many of the budgets go to health and to, uh, to security needs. So viewing all of this makes you wonder, you know, who has the bandwidth of le to learn about the Holocaust? Why should I, a teacher who, you know, trying to survive, trying to struggle and trying to get um, my students' attention, why should I listen to you, Yad Vashem, or to the subject matter? I have really more pressing things on my mind. And this is a big challenge um, for us. So I wanna share um, a few of the things that we are doing uh, to confront these, um, uh, uh, these challenges, um, mainly in the field of, the, of our online uh, activities. I said, uh, or I, I asked um, earlier, you know, what is the story, where, and how do we deliver? Where is the story? Where is the story of education in general and also Holocaust education? Many in three places. The ecosystems of governments, this is the third. The first, of course, um, or the second is the education systems. The first place placed the popular culture and the social networks. The balance between the public sphere, the social networks, and the formal education systems has changed and is changing along the years. So popular culture, the balance goes towards there, more information from the networks, from online, and they're always struggling, right? The public sphere and the formal education uh, uh, systems. Um, so we are at the International School for Holocaust Studies. We're trying to be there on all levels, by the way. We're trying to be there on the, on the political side, but mainly as, the, as a school, we're trying to be physically um, in the places. And you can see uh, the map of all the places, probably much more. It's, I don't think the map, this map is up to date. Um, the physical aspects of formal education systems were trying to be available for the teachers. We give seminars and materials, et cetera, et cetera. But we did it before, but also much, much now in a, in a higher capacity now, we're trying to be available in the public sphere in online, in the online sphere and the social networks and uh, online um, activities. So how do we do that? We're trying to galvanize the crisis. We give in-person seminars, virtual programming, uh, webinars, lectures. Uh, we prepared tons of materials before COVID um, and we make it avail available for the teachers. But we also, I remember it was towards the end of March, we realized that you know no one knows what's going to happen in a month, in two weeks, in, in half a year, there were many, many speculations that I, I said to my staff at the, at the school, listen, we just need to, to go on a, on, a, on a crisis mode and start um, transforming all the materials that we can, that were physical, try start to transform it to digital uh, mode. In order to do that, we need to be very good listeners. And we need to be experts in listening to the needs, to the special needs, and to the exact needs of every culture, every country. Uh, working with German teachers is different than French teachers, different than American teachers, different than Israeli teachers. And we need to be very good listeners and, um, and, and hearing the, the, the needs and addressing them. Uh, so you can see here a collage of, of things that uh, uh, we do, programs that we hold. Uh, we have podcasts that we created, um, video toolboxes for, um, for teachers that addressing key issues like or key questions like what is the Holocaust? In many places in the world, teachers will be afraid to even address the topic because they can't answer this basic question, which is, a, by the way, a hard question. What is the Holocaust? So we provide um, tools for the teachers uh, adopted for online platforms in order to address that, uh, that topic. Animated uh, infographic series we have created, um, educational environments with many suggestions 
and how to teach about the, uh, the Holocaust. And of course, what I want to highlight right now is it became a very effective tool and it got a, a really received a, a world recognition is our MOOC courses uh, that we actually started from 2015. Uh, way before the COVID, we couldn't even imagine that there's going to be a, um, um, you know, a pandemic, a world pandemic. And we created academic level. Um, and then I don't know if you're familiar with the word MOOC. So M-O-O-C is Massive Open Online Courses. These are academic courses, academic, academic level courses on a platform world platforms, there are several of those uh, in the world that are open, free of charge to the public. Uh, and we really spearheaded, uh, and it was a really major breakthrough in 2015, we created a, a MOOC called The Holocaust and Introduction. These are six sessions that explain thoroughly uh, about, about uh, the Holocaust. Since then, only with this MOOC, we already have around 200,000 participants, which is an incredible uh, number. Since then, we created a MOOC about anti-Semitism from its origins to the present. We already have almost uh, 20,000 um, participants, uh, and that's available in English with uh, subtitles in Hebrew, French, and Spanish. Um, you can see on screen some other MOOCs, uh, the new ones, are teaching and learning about the Holocaust, we're gonna release in Spanish, we're gonna release in 2021, but uh, something that was released uh, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, teaching the Holocaust innovative approaches to challenges we face. We did that with UCL, University College of London, and it already received um, very uh, uh, high feedback, positive feedback. So going back um, to the organization, um, I like to think of it as A, B, C, D, E, and V in terms of how do we deal with current situation? What is our current organizational story? Where is the organizational story and how do we deliver it? So um, we're trying to create anchors, you know, and to understand exactly what is the thing that we do. We do Holocaust education. What is Holocaust education? We articulate very uh, very harshly, we, we're trying to be very, uh, very exact in the articulation of what is a must in Holocaust education. What do you must teach? Um, what does it look like in the different cultures, et cetera, et cetera. So these are anchors that help us deliver the story. We need to be bold and creative, and that's what we're trying to do in terms of what do we uh, offer to the public. For example, we started to create uh, communities of teachers just to support them in, in, in this very uh, hard moment where they can't even get the attention of their students, okay, let's help you. And we provide, sometimes we even go and offer our services in terms of talking to the students in the classes and deliver the, the, um, uh, the materials ourselves, just in order to uh, help the, the, um, the teachers. Um, it's all about e-learning and we are reshaping the vision for the school. Now, I want to share with you that the title of this whole session is behind the scenes. So I'm gonna share with you a slide, um, which I did it only for this session. I have to uh, admit these are facts and figures, which even the chairman of Yad Vashem didn't see it because I just sent uh, the conclusion of uh, 2020 uh, with the work plans for 2021. I sent it yesterday for, uh, for the chairman, and I'm sure with all that is going on, uh, he didn't even uh, get the chance to open the, the document. So you are the first ones that I'm, that I'm corresponding these figures uh, with. These are, of course, only highlights. There are many, many, many fingers, but you can see uh, figures, but you can see uh, um, you know, some of, of the capacity of, of the school. We work in with soldiers, uh, thousands of soldiers. We work with more than 100, 110,000 students and young leaders that we work directly, but we influence, well, we work directly with uh, almost 30,000 teachers 
we influence probably millions of students that get our materials that are influenced by our methods and through the teachers that we work with, they hear what we have to say about, um, about the Holocaust. So I think I managed to kind of uh, stay on track uh, and give you uh, some of you. I know that I, um, I, I didn't dive deep enough in some of the topics, but uh, hopefully that gave you uh, some view of what we're facing. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop sharing. Okay. If we want to, to finish uh, as, the, as the host, the main host, thanks to you all. I have such an easy job. It's, it's wonderful. I have such a gr great speakers. Thank you, Lial, for your fantastic presentation. Thank you, Sylvia, for being a brilliant moderator. Thank you, fantastic audience. Couldn't do it without you. And thank you to my wonderful colleagues who are hiding here behind the scenes, Lena and Margaret, as always working it all out. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Come back in two weeks for our final session of this series. Thank you. Salam. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.